The Olympus Trip 35 was first produced in the 60s as an ideal companion for a family holiday, unlike my brother who threw sand in my eyes in France in 2002. If it was made today, the Olympus Trip 35 would have an F10 lens, a one hundredth of a second shutter speed and a plastic body, but no. It was made in 1967 and Olympus went absolutely ham. With a 40mm 2.8 Zuko lens with manual or automatic modes, zonal focusing and the ability to use flash, I think we can all agree that the Olympus Trip 35 pretty much shits on any modern film camera, although that's not hard. All of that aside, the Olympus Trip 35 is effectively solar powered. It measures the light through a selenium cell around the lens and decides between 1 40th of a second or 1 200th of a second. And it decides what aperture to use. If you're shooting it manually, then it will only shoot at 1 40th of a second unless you're using a little secret that I'm gonna show you a little later on in the video. So for now, I'm gonna take this on my own trip to the south coast and see what the Trip 35 can do. We navigated our way through camper vans and morally questionable second homeowners and found ourselves in Cornwall. Doing pretty much anything with the Olympus Trip 35 is really simple. And as a simple man, I really wanted to check it out. You just click open the back, feed the film into the spool and wind it on. Once it's in there, you need to choose the correct ISO. And then after that, you could switch it to automatic and just make sure that you get your focusing right. When it comes to focusing, there are just little symbols on the top of the camera that show a close up person, slightly further away person, a group of people, and then a landscape. Now, most people think that's the only way you can sort of see the focusing distance, but underneath the lens, you can see the actual distances, which are one meter, 1.5 meters, three meters and infinity. For this trip, I decided to use Kodak Portrait 160. I wanted to try and make sure that the highlights didn't end up too blown out, but in the end, perhaps it was a little mistake. I'll get to that a little bit later on. I'll never know why Olympus chose 40 millimeters for their focal length. It's kind of a very weird in-between focal length that it's not bad, but it's like not wide and not human eye focal length. It kind of doesn't make that much sense. But the Zuko lens is really good and really sharp for a camera that basically feels like a point and shoot camera. The fact that the lens stops down to 2.8 is probably a bit of a USP when it comes to this camera, but for the most part, you're not gonna be shooting wide open. As I said earlier, if you're choosing the aperture, then it will only shoot at 1 40th of a second. That is, unless you do some particular things, and then you can shoot at a 200th of a second. 
So I may as well explain how you do that. If you want to shoot manually at 200th of a second, then you need to half press the shutter down while covering the light meter. This will bring up the red flag in your camera. While the red flag is there, you then change your aperture to f11 or above. Once you've done that, you can then go back and choose whichever aperture you want. Let's say you want it to be f5.6. Uh, Once you've chosen the aperture, the shutter speed should be set to 200 and then your aperture is whatever you want it to be and you can then fully press the shutter button. This is a really long-winded way to change your shutter speeds effectively. And I don't think it's really necessary. It's just a, something that you can do. Personally, I would only shoot this camera automatically anyway, so it doesn't really bother me. So I wanna talk about what I enjoyed when shooting this camera. It's so simple but effective for a camera that you can still pick up for about 50 quid these days. It's also small and easy to carry around. It's all the things that you want a camera to be when it's specifically made for holidays. Personally, I love being able to shoot intuitively, not having to think about settings as much, and in a way having those small limitations of zonal focusing and things like that really makes decisions for you. There are quite a lot of pros about the Trip 35, but there is something that I feel like is really letting it down. That is that the metering isn't always going to be perfect or the settings that it chooses is not always going to be perfect. The camera is often making quite a general reading and it could be that there are some quite blown out highlights, particularly in the skies and things like that. That may sort of confuse your camera, confuse which settings that it tries to go for. For me, this resulted in some pretty underexposed shots. So it's worth just being aware of that. Obviously, you might think that this is down to the low ISO film stock that I used, but when you look back at some of the sunset shots and shots like that, it was getting them right. It was looking really good. Now, some of the other shots where I thought the lighting was okay, the camera didn't get it quite right because of the contrast of highlights and shadows. It just wasn't sure what to go for. Now, we've got to forgive the Trip 35 because it's like 50 something years old, but it's just something to be aware of if you were considering buying it. The video isn't over yet, but if you're enjoying it so far, then I really think that it'd be cool for you to subscribe and take a look at some of my other videos. As the name states, the Trip 35 is perfect for holidays and trips. But personally, I think it's a great option if you're someone that would normally go for a disposable camera or one of the many terrible modern reusable cameras. You can take good portraits and landscapes and all sorts with it. Now, obviously it's not for professional use, no matter what David Bailey might tell you. Wait a tick, off a mo. Stone me, you're David Bailey, aren't you? No, no, I'm sorry, I'm not Bailey. Listen, I think you want me. Look, chum, I'm talking to the engineer, not the oily rag. But you can get a lot more out of this than any modern film camera. When I first picked this up, I didn't think any of the shots would be as good or as sharp as they are. It's a cool camera with some annoying limitations, but on the whole, I've really liked shooting with it. But for all the good, there are some common faults that I wanna let you know about. First of all, you're pretty much definitely gonna to have to replace the light seals on your camera. Unless you've had a really good seller that's replaced them for you, chances are that your light seals have completely perished and you would get light leaks if you were to shoot it 
sometimes the ISO ring or the focusing ring can become quite loose and even to the point where it's kind of useless. So it's something that you would either have to get fixed or just replace the camera. Also, the red flag could stop working, which could tell us that maybe the metering isn't working either. So again, that's something that you would have to get fixed or you would replace the camera. Also, the aperture might just not be reacting to the different kinds of light. If you are on auto mode and you point the camera at bright daylight, and then point it into somewhere that's darker. If your aperture is not changing when you do that, then that is a big problem. Again, get it fixed or throw it away. I hope you've enjoyed this one as much as I have. I've got quite a few cameras that I really wanna make videos about, potentially the Pentax K1000 or something like that next. But until then, if you aren't killed by climate breakdown or in jail after an alcohol-fueled rampage, then I'll see you in the next video.